Calendar reform is the final act of history, and the first step toward Earth regeneration in the cradle of galactic culture. To change the calendar now is to change the course of history and to revolutionize altogether the future of civilization on Earth. In making these sweeping but accurate statements, we would be remiss if we did not present a brief history of modern calendar reform, so that we may be able to better grasp the subtleties and far-reaching implications of such reform. We must also understand that the timing of this calendar reform is of a vital nature and presents an evolutionary opportunity for humanity, which it cannot afford to lose. The topic of calendars and calendar reform is not a popular one, for the simple reason that the calendar in use functions as a dogma, and therefore there appears little reason to question it. Most people do not have any idea where the current calendar came from. People who live in mostly non-Western societies function with what is called a lunar calendar, as well as the more recent Gregorian calendar. The lunar calendars also dogmatize the sense of time. Though we speak of the Arab, Hebrew or Chinese lunar calendars, for example, it should be kept in mind that there is only one moon and hence all lunar calendars are actually the same measure. The lunar calendars in use measure the synodic cycle of the moon, from new moon to new moon. This is a cycle of 29 and a half days. Twelve of these synodic lunations take 354 days, 11 days short of the solar orbit of the Earth. The sidereal cycle of the moon the measure of the moon from the same place it appears in the sky is only 27 and one half days. Between the synodic and sidereal measures, the mean lunar cycle is 28 days. While the lunar calendars in use by different world cultures is no way solar calendars or a measure of the Earth's orbit, the Gregorian calendar in use today is an approximation of a solar calendar. We say approximation because on the one hand, while the Gregorian calendar accounts for the 365-day solar cycle, inclusive of one extra day every four years, its standard of measure is irregular and corresponds to no natural cycle whatsoever. It must be unequivocally understood that an irregular standard of measure has a profound effect on the mind, especially an irregular standard of measure of time. This is because time is a mentally perceived phenomenon, unlike space, which is perceived through the senses. A standard of measure which is irregular and uneven is inherently problematic. Our sense of time is a fundamental perception. If the standard of measure of time that we use is irregular, then we must contemplate deeply and understand what it does to our mind over centuries of prolonged use. If the clock represents the mechanization of time, the Gregorian calendar is the instrument which normalizes the mechanization of time as a mental institution, inseparable from the irrational irregularities of its monthly count. In this way, modern human civilization has acquired its quality of institutionalized machine efficiency, inseparable from a host of irrational social problems, crime and war. Aside from the Vatican itself, which preceded and sponsored the Gregorian calendar reform, virtually all of the inventions, nation-states, and institutions of the modern world are incorporated in this calendar. Any attempt to reform the current civil calendar 
must come to terms with everything that is incorporated in this calendar. Some 200 years after the Gregorian calendar reform came the French Revolution and the call for a new calendar. The Republican calendar of 1793 replaced the Gregorian calendar with a 12-month schedule of 30 days each, plus a 5-day period at the end of the year. The French Republican calendar was essentially the same as a Babylonian type, which had the same way of dividing the year into 12 30-day months, with a 5-day purification cycle at the end. Every four years this 5-day period of the French Republican calendar was extended to 6 days, to account for the quarter day. The 7-day week was replaced by the Decalogue, or 10-day cycle. The French Republican calendar lasted 10 years, until 1803, when it was replaced by the Gregorian calendar once again. The anti-ecclesiastical, pro-rationalist sentiment which animated the French Republican calendar was also behind the proposed calendar reform of the 19th century French thinker Auguste Comte, 1798-1857. Best known as the founder of the modern discipline of sociology, philosopher and mathematician Auguste Comte had the opportunity in the 1840s of learning about a calendar of 13 months of 20 days each. This information came from travelers who had been to Tahiti, where this calendar was well known among the Polynesians. This universal indigenous calendar so impressed Comte by its harmonic form and biological truthfulness that he devoted several years to studying it before he finalized its form as the Positivist Calendar presented at an 1849 session of the Positivist Society. Apart from Comte's proposal for a 13-month calendar, which of necessity observes an extra day out of time, the call for calendar reform continued in France and elsewhere in Europe, but with a focus on maintaining a 12-month cycle and a 7-day week. During the 1890s, there was considerable agitation for a new calendar to begin the 20th century. In 1900, a conference was organized in Eisenach. In 1900, a conference was organized in Germany for the study of the reform of the Gregorian calendar. Throughout these efforts, the papal response was always very intense in the defense of the current calendar for liturgical reasons. But a further defense put forth by the Vatican was that any calendar reform had to respect the succession of the seven-day week. This argument of the Vatican very much restricts or even deadlocks the debate on calendar reform and essentially functions as a catch-22, which says, yes, you can reform the calendar, but only so long as there is no break in the succession of the seven-day week and that there are twelve months. Anyone skilled at problem-solving will see that these guidelines very much limit the possibilities of calendar reform, and in fact, have been the cause of a lack of success of every effort at calendar reform in the last 150 years. Indeed, all that this argument really amounts to is an expression of the power of the Catholic Church to maintain its calendar as the world standard. This notwithstanding, it is of great interest that the 13-moon positivist calendar of Comte, originally derived from the indigenous Polynesians of Tahiti, figured again in the Pan-American Scientific Congress, held in Santiago, Chile from December 25, 1908 to January 5, 1909. In this seminal event, a Peruvian by the name of Carlos A. Hesse introduced a calendar reform using a 13-month calendar identical of that of Augusto Comte. While we cannot say exactly where Hesse derived his calendar, being from Peru, it is highly likely that he knew that the Andean civilization, conquered by the Europeans, possessed a 13-moon calendar, as did the Tahitians. Still in use today, the Peruvian 13-moon calendar is correlated to the 500-year Pachacuti cycles, and is currently in its 11th Pachacuti cycle, year 5506. The logical nature of the 13-moon calendar attracted English railroad magnate Moses B. Cotsworth, who formed the League of the International Fixed Calendar. In 1921, the International Chamber of Commerce in London, England, decided to promote the calendar worldwide, and the matter was taken to the League of Nations. 
During the 1920s, Cotsworth attracted the interest of George Eastman of Eastman Kodak, who organized a great campaign on behalf of the International Perpetual Calendar. At the League of Nations, a committee to study the topic of calendar reform received numerous proposals, but by far and away the most popular was the International Perpetual Calendar. In the United States alone, over 100 industries of great diversity of interest were ready to adopt the 13-month perpetual calendar. The League of Nations determined that January 1, 1933 would be the date to commence with the new calendar. Since that year began on a Sunday, the perpetual calendar always begins on a Sunday and ends on a Saturday. While maintaining a close tie with the traditional names of the months of the Gregorian calendar, the 13th month being called Tricember, the opposition to the calendar was mounted against the Null Day, between the last Saturday of one year and the first Sunday of the next year. This is because 13 times 28 equals 364 days, or 52 perfect weeks, which is what attracted the accountants of industry, and the solar year counts 365 days. Despite the sheer self-existing perfection of form of the 13-month calendar, Resistance to it focused on a great campaign against the unique Null Day, the very point by which it maintained its perpetual perfection. Here the inertia of institutionalized ignorance and disharmony were able to put a stop to this otherwise most successful effort at calendar reform. In 1931, the 111 delegates representing the 42 member states of the League of Nations listened to the 28 pages of the report of the Preparatory Commission. While many countries including the United States, Brazil, France, Switzerland and Germany voted in favor of the 13-month calendar, Hungary, Italy and the Netherlands voiced opposition to the institution of a perpetual calendar which implied the introduction of supplementary days. Support for this antagonistic position grew with the objection of various astronomers, such as Federico Ulm of the Astronomical Observatory of Lisbon, and Pope Pius XI, who argued that the break in the succession of the seven-day week would create chaos and calamity. The Pope further argued that the matter of fixing the date of Easter was exclusively under his jurisdiction. This position was further supported by editorials in leading newspapers such as the London Times, October 13, 1931, which argued in favor of the religious scruples, and the New York Times, December 16, 1934, which echoed the reasoning concerning the damage to be done by breaking the weekly succession, a succession which, it was argued, had not been broken since the most ancient biblical times. Perceived as an attack on religion and the succession of the week, despite the great amount of money spent on the campaign to promote the 13-month calendar, the project floundered and could not withstand the conservative sentiments of the church, certain scientists, and leading periodicals. Supported by a counterinsurgency of various organizations wishing to create an atmosphere favorable to the abolition of the Gregorian calendar, a final effort was made in favor of a moderated 12-month calendar to occur on Sunday, January 21, 1939. However, this calendar also contained the notorious Null Day, and on September 4, 1937, the Committee of Communications of the Society of Nations in Geneva arrived at the conclusion that the time had not yet come to reform the calendar. In 1950, Pope Pius XII issued a pronouncement that the Church was not opposed to calendar reform, but was opposed to the proposals that included universal days, which are not days of the seven-day week. This sentiment is echoed in the 1962 Declaration of Calendar Reform at the conclusion to the Vatican II Ecumenical Council. As of the middle of the 20th century, the Gregorian calendar prevailed worldwide.